<laughs> so I am absolutely delighted to be here. And I'm delighted to see a really full room of people who are you know, interested in ideas. One of the things I would like to do tonight is to keep the discussion civil. I am going to open up questions to the floor as well. Um, there are very diverse views, I think, on this panel. I am not an expert on feminism anymore. I read Naomi's book years and years ago, and I was like, oh, this is cool. No, I'm getting married. I'm not changing my name. I got my own identity. And so my perspective is I'm a humanist. I believe we're all individuals. I don't think gender actually matters if you believe in ideas. But there are a lot of interesting things to explore here, and I'm interested to do it with such a fantastic panel. I'm going to ask all of you to introduce yourself. We'll go from right to left, or left to right, depending on which way you're looking, <laughs> and um, just kind of go down the line, talk about sort of who you are, where you come from, and maybe say where you fall on the spectrum of feminism. Um, okay, I'm Karen Strawn. Uh, I am a working class, uh, divorced mother of three, and I come from a solid working class background. And uh, I fall completely outside the spectrum of feminism. <laughs> I, I don't, I, like, I, there are some things uh, that feminists espouse that I do agree with, but I, I do not agree with the bulk of feminism and feminist thought. And uh, that is what I have made sort of my mission over the last three to four years, is uh, just exploring what, uh, what the world is like, what gender, what the world of gender is like, what our natures are like, and, and how feminism has got it wrong, and is uh, the, how they've misdiagnosed the problem, and how they are attempting to apply a harmful cure to a problem that maybe doesn't exist or maybe is not curable. So that's where I'm coming from. So there you go. Thank you, Karen. Naomi. Thank you. I'm, I'm so, I just want to say first thank you for inviting me because I'm so honored to be part of this. I've been sort of angling for an invitation for years. <laughs> and uh, you know, of all, the, of all the places in America, I where there are people doing things that matter about the issues that matter, this is ground zero of change and importance. <laughs> so I, I could not be more honored. Now, who am I? I'm a, a writer and a mom and a single mom. And um, I uh, usually write about women's issues and what is that? I've written about childbirth, I've written about anorexia and beauty ideals, I've written about growing up female and the challenges about that and you know wonderful things. Um, but I also most, more recently have written about civil liberties, which is probably why I'm here. I wrote a book called The End of America about the growing police state and a sequel called Give Me Liberty about what you can do about the growing police state, which you are actually doing and teaching me Whoa. more things for and about. It I'm, might be like I consult them once in a while and I'm like, oh, we should be doing this. Yes. Oh, good, good. Um, I'm so glad. And so about feminism, I, I, I'm, I identify as a feminist, but I really want to stress that I think that there are a million definitions and many of them are wrong. Um, and that for me, how I like to define it, and I, I am going to agree with Karen probably about a lot of things, there are a lot of ways recent feminism um, some spokespeople have kind of gone into a ditch ideologically, which we can get into. To, so I, I'm interested in redeeming the original vision of feminism, which I think a lot of you here would agree with, which was Mary Wollstonecraft's vision came out of the Enlightenment, where a lot of liberty ideals came out of. And it was basically the idea that everyone on the planet is entitled to be free, and everyone on the planet is entitled to live out his or her, her full potential and be an individual without constraints of, of gender. Um, so that doesn't mean there aren't differences. Mm. It, it's just about potential and dignity and human freedom. So that's my definition of feminism. Thank you. I'm Antigone Darling. I am a podcaster. Um, I talk into a microphone on a weekly basis, so <laughs> doing that. Um, it's called Sex, Lies, and Anarchy. Um, 
I end up talking a lot about feminism and gender issues, probably because I'm a woman, so people ask me about that. Um, I have a friend of mine who told me, yeah, you're a feminist because you're a woman, and you're, you know, you're a strong, <laughs> independent woman, and hence you're a feminist. Like, there are so many problems with you saying that right now. Um, on the spectrum, um, I'm a fan of both the ladies up here, um, and what Naomi just said it makes her sound like an anarchist. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so now we just have to talk about the sex part. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't know where I'll be on the spectrum, but uh, I don't think anyone would disagree that everyone should live a life of dignity. Uh, but the dictionary, as a friend of mine likes to point out, the dictionary says that feminism is the idea that women should have equal rights to men, and I don't think men have enough rights, so I, you know, that's where I am. Well, and I think ultimately that, that is probably where we're going to end up. But I'd like to explore some ideas because someone promised me a riot. <laughs> so, you know, we, we, we got to... I it was a cat fight. <laughs> no, see, it would be a cat fight. It was all girls, but we got a lot of boys, so we need a riot. Oh, okay. there's, there's <laughs> Actually, we're very nonviolent people, of course. Yeah, yeah. And so um, one of the questions that sort of came up, and I think because so many of us are on the liberty spectrum, sort of interested in how do we gain more freedom and what are better tools to get there, and is feminism perhaps a good or a bad tool? And I won't say what I think about that, but I'm sure a lot of people here know. But we have had in the past as Antigone said, you know, men don't have enough rights. So we know women don't have enough rights because, you know, we have the structure of the state. But there were certain things that women were granted, I guess. You know, once you're talking about rights, it sort of gets complex. But there were things that libertarianism or um, more freedom gave to women. And some of it was, hey, you guys gave us the vote. No. Personally, I'm like, oh, I don't think voting is such a great solution to anything. But thank you. Thank you, overlords. <laughs> you know, um, it gave us uh, the ability to own property. It gave us the ability to get divorced, by way of example. So if we're going to assume that the government should grant rights in these ways, then they should grant them equally. Um, are there some things that you think are issues now and where would you see feminism going? So I'm going to direct that to Naomi first. Mm. Wow, you mean, are you asking me, are there issues that need, should be tackled because there's gender inequity? Is that what sure, you mean? Sure, yeah, issues? let's go okay. with that. Um, so I guess the first thing I would say, um, it, uh, so classical feminist analysis that I actually do agree with from the 70s would say that if you only look at the state, giving and taking away rights, you're missing an important insight, which I think was valuable, which is that sometimes there can be rights taken away by individuals between each other, for instance, in a domestic context or a, a, a sexual violence context. For instance, in India right now, there's a huge uh, grassroots movement, I was just in India, where women and men are taken to the streets because women are raped violently in the street and no one is safe walking the street. And it's not the state engaging in those rapes, right? But the women are petitioning the state to create more fair laws and more police taking it seriously and so on. Same with domestic violence. A feminist analysis of the 70s was that if, uh, if a culture gives men, or I would say any group, but in this case, the example is men as a whole, uh, the entitlement socially or culturally, not just through the law, to beat up women, and the culture says, well, that's your lot, or be a good wife, or put up with it, or be silent, that that's a form of taking away rights or injustice that is just as serious as if the state takes away your rights. I, th I do think that's an important insight. I would add to you that a woman can beat up a man, a woman can beat up a child. You know, there's no gendering of injustice or cruelty. There um, is, though. Well, there okay, do you, do you mind if I just... Go ahead. Finish this and then. Hey, riot time! Okay, okay, okay. But I just, I just want to stress for the purposes here, so we make the best use of our time, that there's not a single thing I believe about feminism or the world that's all men or all women. I don't see the world that way. I see human beings just as you do. 
Um, so now what are the issues ahead that feminism, or le when I say feminism for a community like this, what I think it could be valuable from feminism is a tool of analysis, right, not a prescription. And so an interesting tool of analysis for a liberty community that you could take from feminism is, for instance, um, well, gee, this is tough. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, if indeed um, women are still uh, making 20 cents less than men are for doing the same work, um, and that impedes their ability to create movements like this, to contribute, to run for office, to generate you know, uh, their own destiny, um, there's an analysis you could use of how the society can keep getting away with that. Um, and there are other cool things that feminism does, like look at how culture takes away certain kinds of freedom of thought, right? Um, like the beauty myth was about that. Like right. if you're raised to think that only one way of being beautiful is possible, that affects your self-esteem, your courage, your sense of value about yourself. That's a great insight, whether you're male or female or call yourself a feminist or not, for a liberty community to look around and think, well, how is the culture bombarding us with messages, not just laws, but books, movies, songs, about co uh, compromise and obedience? And, and how are renegades and pioneers and dissidents seen in the culture and in the news media these days, right? These are not just what's the government doing. This is a feminist, it's a tool from feminism that you can now apply to any kind of analysis. So those are two examples I would give. That's great. Um, Karen, it looked like you wanted to jump in there. <laughs> I did, I did. You know, like, honestly, in 1904, uh, Theodore Roosevelt started a campaign to bring back the whipping post. And he wanted to bring it back as a punishment exclusively for men who beat their wives. And the reason he wanted to use the whipping post to punish men who beat their wives was because if a man was jailed for wife battering, his wife might suffer hunger or want. And if he was fined for wife battering, she might suffer hunger or want. Okay, But if he got 30 lashes at the public post, he could still go to work the next day and he could still support her, right? Now, we have this idea that before feminism came along in the 60s and 70s, that domestic violence against women was completely socially acceptable. Now, I don't understand how one can come to that conclusion when the President of the United States wanted to bring back corporal punishment, which had been banned, right, in most states at that time exclusively to punish men who batter their wives. And especially since the treatment in communities for men who were battered by their wives, of which there were many, and you can see friezes and artwork from the 1600s and the 1700s that show women battering their husbands with their rolling pins and their skillets and all of that. Uh, Robbie Burns, Ode to a Henpecked Husband, all of those things. There were women who were abusive to men at that time. And the treatment that the community gave those men was either the Skimmington Ride, uh, which was the practice of the community coming around the house at night and beating pots and pans and screaming and throwing things at the house to shame him for allowing himself to be beaten by his wife. <laughs> or they put him on a donkey backwards holding its tail and rode him around the town square and threw or strapped him to a cart and threw rotten fruit and vegetables at him to shame him for allowing his wife to beat him. Okay? And these things have been just quietly erased from modern scholarship and modern uh, accounts of history, right? Back when we thought it was okay to beat your wife, right? When we thought it was okay to beat your wife, at least when it was extremely egregious, particularly egregious, we'd strap the guy to a whipping post and give him 30 lashes. When your wife was beating you, right, it was you that got punished by the community, right? So I don't know that feminism has a, a balanced perspective on any of these things. I really don't. Well, I think there are, there are several issues here, and part of it is, I. I Notice the word henpecked. Mm. 
And I think that you know, language is important. And as liberty activists, certainly, I think our best tool in our arsenal is persuasion. Mm. And so, you know, it's important to think about words and to say that, you know, was that a fair word even to use? Well, right? okay, what, what's a cockfight? It's a cockfight is two co two roosters pecking each other to death, right? You know, when you're talking about chickens, pecking is violence, right? But maybe the 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 issue here is not so much male on female violence or female on male violence or chicken well, on it shouldn't chicken be. It shouldn't violence. Be. It shouldn't it's, be gendered, but it is. But, it's right? seen as gendered. And so maybe the exploration over the long term should be how do we and can we move away from and do we want to move away from sort of feminism language to a language that addresses the same issues from an in individualist standpoint. So if we actually started to look at the question as individualism and violence instead of male and female, would that further this dialogue? Yeah, I mean, respectfully, you know, with all due mm. respect, I, um, I don't know of any feminists anymore, maybe in the 70s when there were a lot of bad ideas around, but I, I don't know <laughs> of any feminists who work on domestic violence who don't take seriously... Um, you know, 17% of boys have been sexually abused before they're 18 and, you know, 30% of girls. And every, every feminist I know who works on domestic violence cares about boy victims as much as girl victims. And, you know, the same thing with domestic violence. We call it domestic violence instead of wife beating now because we recognize that it's gender neutral. Anyone can be in an abusive relationship. I, I think that with I, all respect, I don't, your, I, your that's ideas not, are a little out of date. That's not my experience of feminism even today. I have, uh, I have conversations daily online with uh, feminists who have taken women's studies, they've taken gender studies, and they will repeat uh, that 95% of domestic violence is male on female perpetrated. I, I actually, there was a, a report by the Ottawa Octava, the Ottawa Council on Violence Against Women. And uh, they took data from a Stats Canada study that showed 585,000 male victims and 601,000 female victims of domestic violence who had reported that they had been assaulted in the last five years. And when they did their study, they uh, reported it as 1.2 million Canadian women. I, I don't know what to say about that. I haven't seen the you know, study, but I guess, can I just say something? Like, you know, there's all the studies show that young men in their 20s commit by far the most acts of violence, whether it's arson or, you know, uh, beating people up in bars or whatever. I don't think that that's the most, I don't think that's what we should spend our precious time on. Like, who's the gender of the perpetrator? I think right. what we should spend our precious time on is stopping violence in the home and when there's an insight about gender that could help us address that, that's what we should focus on positively rather than casting blame. Here's an example. There's this great organization called Man Up, which is global now, and they are enlisting men, which I think is the next wave of feminism, if you want to know where I think it okay, should go. Um, and they enlist men, especially young men all over the world, to engage in um, fighting rape and sexual assault and domestic violence against women. And it's incredibly effective, and it's, it's having fantastic outcomes, and it's teaching young men wonderful new ways of being a man and how to define successful masculinity. It's standing up against people hurting you know, women and children um, or other men. And uh, I guess I'd like to focus on well, how, what's the point I'm making is that that organization came about through an analysis of gender inequity or gender distortion in those societies and an analysis that led people to think, well, here in you know, Rwanda, there's all this rape and war. How can we raise the next generation to not think you know, rape and war is an okay thing to do? And they're successful. And to me, like we're about making a world that's better, right? That's what we're here for. And life is so short. So with all due respect, I would much rather focus on how we can work together and learn together rather than pointing fingers at, you know, uh, at the well, past especially. Okay, okay, well, but okay, on, so man on. up, man up. What, what is Karen, man up Karen, Karen, other than pointing fingers? I'm the moderator. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I would like
like uh, Antigone to jump in here. It seems to me that um, this is more a conversation about violence rather than about genders. And it's, I don't like the name feminism because it's not about women. It's about everyone. I don't and like the name man up. At, <laughs> and at the same time, um, I am not as knowledgeable about you know, Rwanda or India, and I'm not going to have examples outside of America, unfortunately. That's my bad. I'm embarrassed. But in schools we have little boys who are punished for rambunctious behavior. Yeah, that's not right. I think this country has a big problem with masculinity yeah. and, and a big problem with medicating I children. I agree with you totally. And with feminism focusing on just girls, with just even the name of it, you know, I think is a problem. I think it's interesting to look at violence mm -hmm. in the past. I think as people exchange more ideas, meet different people, I mean, Racism was accepted before, but, you know, we've got the internet now. We're all one, you know, and we're That's over nice. that, yeah. right, yeah. for the most part. Because if someone says something racist around anyone that I know, like that, oh, you just put yourself in the racist box. We don't talk to people like you, you know. Um, that we've gone past. Um, but I think a lot of the issues that come up with feminism were actually brought upon by the state. So I actually disagree with what Carla said probably 20 minutes ago at this, <laughs> at this point. I should have jumped in there. Um, but the state did not grant the right to vote. That's true. Or the right to own property. In 1760, in Boston, 40% of taverns were owned by women. And then these like old white dudes with their powdered wigs came along and made all these laws. And women let them get away with that. So there's that. And, and then slowly, like, oh, you get the vote back. You know, women did have property. Then the government comes along where now they can't have property. And the only people that could vote were people that had enough wealth to be taxed. Then men got the vote because they could be conscript, uh, conscripted. So you've got people giving up their property. And then you've got people giving up their lives. And then women just kind of got it. I think they got it because of the temperance movement. So a lot of the feminists that they talk about in school, and a lot of this is going to go back to school, I'm not going to be able to pronounce her name. Mary Wool Wollstonecraft. Wollstonecraft. I have read about her before, but in school we hear about Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and um, I keep talking about how we shouldn't talk about these people, and I actually forgot the other one, but the ones in history class that we learn about, um, the suffragettes, are the ones that had temperance as their number one thing, which kind of goes back to what that's Karen was saying. I mean, respectfully, that's not what their number one thing was. It was the vote. They, they fought for 60 years to get the vote. And it was, the state didn't give women the vote. It was a grassroots movement like this one that fought and fought and fought women. The state themselves gave to the gave. women, they, the state gave women the vote. The Eventually, state, yeah. women secured the vote from the state because the state has to validate your vote for your vote to be yeah. meaningful. But women fought and struggled for three generations to demand the vote. It wasn't something that was handed to them. That's um, I did. Well, the okay. Women in Utah, in the Utah Territory, had the vote until 1887 when the federal government took, took it, it away, away again. You're absolutely right. Oh, we see a You're big right. bad here, right. people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a big bad in this scenario? Um, You're right. Okay, okay. And the, uh, the sentiments of the Declaration of Sentiments. Yes. Um, I read over that the other night, and everything, it, it was, I mean, it was written really badly. It was like, he has <laughs> taken this away. He, he, he. Man, man, man. And I could easily go through that entire list and remove he and man, replace it with the state. You could. And That's it would totally easy. make sense. But are, we're, we're confirming an insight that, you know, you, you helped us bring up a few beats ago, which is these ways of analyzing, you know, interpersonal relations and the state versus the individual, they can intersect in really rich and important ways. In other words, it was new. Like, let's keep in mind history. I, I think it's very important for a movement like this to, to keep in mind history and how history flows. When they wrote the Declaration of Sentiments, it was brand new to have an analysis that there could be an oppressor in the home. It's such an old idea for us now that we're trying to move past it and think, well, that's a re restrictive way to look at men and women. But at that time, it was revolutionary, right, to, to be, for women to stand up. And let's, you know, we're in a liberty community. These women could not vote, could not own property, could not keep their children in a divorce. If they had a, they, there was a double standard for divorce. Men could divorce a woman for adultery. A woman had to say cruelty and sodomy and bigamy before they could get a divorce. <laughs> They, they couldn't keep their own money. Um, they could be whipped, they, you know, and on and on and on. And so for them to stand up and say, 
he's oppressing us, and they also had plenty to say about the state, was very much in keeping, I think, with what you all are doing. It's very much part of the heritage, and I think we have to kind of make space for where they were, you know, 150 years ago, and that they hadn't finished the analysis, just like we haven't finished the analysis. So I want Does that make sense, what I just said? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I want to uh, sort of change. Well, men can't keep their kids, right? That, so yeah, that's true. We have completely gone the yeah. opposite. And it, well, whether or not men had as much control as you say or not, today, women have. Which is well, not the, fair. The, the, main, the main difference between what was before and what is now is that men got their kids because men were 100% financially responsible for their children, right? So when men got their kids, they got the entire bill, right? And then when the Tender Years Doctrine came into effect and women started getting default custody, women got custody and men got the bill. But this sort of, once again, from a liberty perspective, sort of circles back to the idea if you take um, decision makers that are the state out of the equation, how would we just on an individualist level deal with those issues? I mean, so much of what I'm hearing is really because, you know, we have the overlords who are like, oh, first you can't vote. Oh, we don't like black people. Now you can vote. Now we can, I mean, the, the whole canard really of the state just comes to light, I think, in feminism. It's actually a really good way to to show sort of the, 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 the problem with the state because well, ultimately it, we have to decide are we going to you know, keep writing laws that start to protect certain groups over other groups or how do we proceed forward? Well, but All fem feminists should be anarchists. <laughs> in, in New Hampshire it's allowed when you're going through a divorce to have a mediator. In some states you can't do that. You need to involve lawyers. Hmm. You know, wow. if you're getting divorced, you did love that person at some point. And then when you involve lawyers and judges, there are people that, have tr that I know that have tried to have an amicable divorce, but then the state gets in the way. So, I mean, that would be a great movement there. All feminists just work on abolishing the state. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I don't think that's I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think that's going to happen because uh, you know if you look at if you look at the National Organization for Women and their extended long long history of advocacy against shared parenting legislation, shared parenting be, being a what's their position now today? Uh, their position now today is they still oppose it. They oppose shared parenting? They oppose a any legislation that it would impose a rebuttable presumption of shared parenting. Right? Any kind of start Is shared legislated parenting what it sounds like? Legislate mm? Shared parenting after divorce would be, you know, 50-50, 60-40 custody okay, just time, making right? Sure. You know. Um, Are you sure that's not in the case of the, the guy being abusive? Uh, no, what they're, what they're saying is they will not support any legislation that would, would make the starting point in a divorce be that if neither parent is unfit and both parents want it, shared parenting is the starting point. I mean, I have to they, see that citation because that does not sound right to uh, me. I have citations. You just, just have just to email you, it to me. Yeah, I will. <laughs> okay. And they have been, and, and I have talked, I actually talked to an advocate for shared parenting, and she's been lobbying about this for the last 15 years, right, doing, as she uh, spoke to me on Skype from Washington, D.C., night before last, uh, after a round of, like, you know, four days of five meetings a day, right, in, in Washington. And she said, everywhere I go, there are feminists there opposing me, right? And I am there to propose... Uh, basically legislation that, I mean, if feminists didn't oppose it, why, why don't we have it? That's right? a non-sensible okay. sentence. Because 80% 80, 80 I mean, 80 80 of anywhere between 60 and 80%, depending on where you are, between 60 and 80% of the general population in polls support shared parenting legislation. I mean, can I ask you something? I live in New York and I'm divorced. Everybody I know shares custody of their children. Uh, okay. I don't know anyone who could say to their lawyer, oh, he my. can't have 
the kids yeah. more than I can have the kids unless oh. they're like a drug addict or violent. I don't know what world you're living in. You, I mean, are, respectfully, you are a wealthy woman. I'm actually not, but um, thanks for that stereotyping, insulting uh, I'm sure assumption you, I'm, about my income. Oh, oh yeah. Um, <laughs> you, you have, you know, like it, you can afford, you can afford to live in New York, frankly. You have no idea what my personal circumstances are. Okay, all right. I am jumping in but, here because that's okay. what a good moderator but, would do, right? <laughs> the uh, if if you actually if you actually look outside your sphere, right, of of your friends, um, I know I know a whole bunch of people who. Like I know, this is not about money. Well, it's about the law. The it, law in right. New York doesn't let women take their kids more than men take their kids. I mean, kids. I think it you just know, we, doesn't. We don't want to focus on the yeah. anecdotal because we all have stories. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, but but basically, what it is is the the National Organization for Women has consistently opposed this, and they have opposed it on the basis that it, number one would endanger women and children because the men might be abusive. Right. I mean, I'd have to are see we, this next. I've never. Are seen we it. assuming that now yeah. kind of represents? Uh, there's the largest feminist organization right. in well, the U.S. Fair to, I, to call them to account if they do. In college, okay. which was and, like a decade ago, I read an official statement from now that said all fathers' rights groups are pederasts. Oh my God! Yeah, no, that, it was and, official from yeah. now. Jesus. So yeah. guess how many times I listened to in now. College? <laughs> In college, yes. like it was an actual source. Oh, they. Because there's was, a lot of nonsense on the internet too <laughs> that it attributes to, to feminist. It was online Michigan and an Action official Alert. public. You know, so I don't. Because I don't listen to them. Michigan anymore. National right. Organization Action I, Alert. I think we're, alerting like, us to the, the fact that they're in an abusers' lobby. Right. I have to say, the journalist in me is uncomfortable with this because we're saying, oh, there's all this positioning, but we don't have any evidence. Can someone just Google National Organization of Women and what's their, you know, She's position on, on shared parenting and you know, and, and are, do they say men's groups are pederasts? I mean, you know, it, please. Um, it, it basically said that it was a Michigan one that said this that they... Do we have a hand mic? Hold on a sec. Or actually, if you want to come and come up, we have this mic. Let's not make it an operation. Oh, wait, they've got one. I, I actually already Googled off that particular page, but it said they oppose forced shared parenting. Uh, that, but none of the legislation would force shared parenting. I'm just saying what they yeah. said. But, see, no, this but they opposed the legislation. Can we just say there's a big they difference? They opposed the, the legislation. No, that's all. <laughs> they opposed the legislation by portraying it as, as something that would be forced. I mean, she just has the citation. Yeah. You know, we really, look, can I just say something about, about accuracy and sourcing? And I'm saying this from the heart, and it's with mm. respect to you, okay? It's so important for citizens to act as journalists in a time when the police state is cracking down on us. And what I mean by that is, it is we're so bombarded with propaganda and spin. It is so crucial for every single one of you to not leave it to the gatekeepers, not leave it to the journalists or editors, but to take yourselves as journalists and editors so seriously and, and value truth and accuracy and check data, check your facts, don't take anything, you know, by anyone's assertion, don't take it on faith, check it for yourself and really respect evidence and facts because otherwise we live in China, we live in a police okay, state where okay. everybody's well, at the that, mercy. We live in a world where true. bonsai kittens are real. Okay, right? but, Do you guys but, remember bonsai kittens? But you, you look at it and you, you say, like this, they had this come up in Australia where, where uh, a, a mother's, a, a single mother's group Right, a single mother's advocacy, advocacy group went and wrote an entire article about why such and such bill ab about shared parenting was a bad idea, and they they basically said that it would enforce shared parenting, that it would apply even if the father was abusive, that blah 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 blah, that it would force this arrangement of 50/50 custody, physical custody on parents, even if it didn't wasn't workable, even if the man worked in camp and he was gone two weeks out of I, every three. I feel like right? we're getting and, that into and they're and they're completely mis misrepresenting the legislation. You can right? criticize that group, but that's not a criticism of feminism. Uh, I'm sitting here and I'm confused as to what feminism is. I know what the dictionary definition of it is, and I already saw that. And I, I was pretty much thinking I didn't agree with any of the feminists from the 60s and 70s. I uh, read this article written by Susan Faludi about, I'm gonna get this wrong, Shumalith Firestone. Good enough. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she had some great comments there, and one of them was that the state 
uh, treats women like children. And, and then that, of course, would follow that the state treats men that same way, and, and that's really screwed up that they treat children like children right, right, also. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, I want to read more right. of her stuff. And so does that mean anything about the feminists of well, that decade? You know, I'm, really glad, I'm really glad you're asking this, Antigone, because I really want to say I don't think there is any one such thing as feminism, just like there's not any one such thing as libertarianism or anarchism or any one <laughs> liberty movement. And that's as it should be in a real democracy, you know, there are a million feminisms, as many as there are thinking men and women who are thinking about gender or the issues that it raises. And the other thing I'd like to say, just you know, on the record, especially for this community whose progress I value so much, is here we are. You know, in 1962, when I was born, you know, women couldn't go to the university I went to. They couldn't be Rhodes Scholars, and I went to, you know, I mean, whatever. I had a lot of free education that I couldn't afford. Uh, on scholarship, <laughs> and uh, you know they couldn't, they couldn't get credit in their own name. They couldn't leave an abusive, re you know, relationship, and on and on and on. And now here we are, and like half of us here are women, and we assume, and our daughters assume, they can do what they want. They'll have equal rights, at least in the law. They can run for office and be president. They can change things. You know, and even from the early 90s when I was a baby feminist to now when I've got an 18-year-old daughter, my daughter's assumptions about what's open to her are so much bigger than, you know, even when I began my career. And this is important for us because we're trying to create a revolution. And we need to believe that change is possible. And so the fact that, you know, feminism, you know, women f and men fought for all of these changes and believed in the world that could be, and we're really inheriting, those rights and freedoms, you may not agree with how they did it, you may not think it's relevant, but the lesson's important for the liberty movement because it means you can change the world. Yeah. Great. Um, so would it be fair to say, and it probably won't be, but I'll say it anyway, mm -hmm. that possibly like the next wave of feminism, what I heard here to some extent was, hey, the problem is the state. The state used to be a bunch of old dudes the state has now evolved where because we have women rights, um, you know, the state, the government, the people making the decisions are now, you know, half men, half women. Um, maybe and, you know, if we push feminism to its logical conclusion, maybe, you know, in 20 years, it'll be all women running the state because it used to be all men running the state. And so the question really becomes is what is the problem? Right? What is actually the problem here? I see Jeff doing a. Okay. <laughs> I thought you had something to contribute, but um, we have <laughs> women. Women are just as evil as men. Oh no! This I whole like that. fair <laughs> sex thing. For but sure. I think you know. Ultimately, I think in some ways where feminism sort of emerged from was a power structure that at the time looked like a power structure between men and women because that was the actual power structure at that time. It was between wealthy, property-owning men of European, of the correct European yeah, I, descent. I, I mean, it's not men. I don't think, I think it was when society became a little bit more prosperous and people's lives were a little bit easier and they weren't working, the working class weren't working 16 hours a day just to survive. I think that was when, uh, when the divide occurred between men and women where women started to say, this isn't fair. And, you know, and you it, know it occurred, it occurred in the upper classes <laughs> first, right? It occurred in the upper classes first where women looked around and said, said, why can't I be a barrister like my father? rather than why can't I work 14 hours a day in a coal mine like my husband? I, can I just say, I have to say, you know, and I keep saying with respect, but I guess I need to just be really honest. Your, your facts just are not right. That's not historically the origin of feminism. I'm sorry. W women have been working class women, women in mines, women in factories, women in service, have yes. been fucking complaining about gender injustice ever since they could speak. Uh, and it, this is in the record, and you know I can give you the Women citations. in mines, women in factories who would rather not have been there. Of course, but they were noticing that they were paid a fraction of what the men in the I mines know, were paid. I know, and, and they, they were shoveling coal onto lorries when the men were going down underground. All I'm saying is that every you, you're imagining a world in which these privileged 
I women mean, invented I don't, feminism I when there was never, time. I and have I'm saying, never said that working mm -hmm. class women invented feminism. Well, no, I'm saying working class women did invent feminism. I don't <laughs> think so. I, I think the working class women were too busy getting by. Well, all, all I can say is I'm happy to send you a list of sources and yeah. records that my point is human beings have been fighting oppression ever since they could speak i don't and think the those women felt that. oppressed by their husbands oh my I god i really don't okay they well. felt oppressed by a lot of things but they felt oppressed by their husbands they were oppressed by you know working in houses where they were raped by their employers they were oppressed by if they had any sexual experience they could never marry and so they had to become prostitutes and then they were used up and couldn't make a living and then they had to go to the workhouses they were oppressed by pregnancies they couldn't avoid they were oppressed okay, by and, not being able to get access to contraception. And, and men, men were oppressed by uh, being pressed into service in yes, the merchant marines, yes, and they were oppressed yes, by being drafted into yes. war, and they were oppressed I don't by doubt being, any of it. being okay, forced so and we, being we jailed if they failed to provide the necessities of their life for their wives. I mean, like, is, you know what, it's not the oppression Olympics. It's, it's, it was shit for okay. everybody. Okay. Not, that's okay. not gender <laughs> oppression. <laughs> is to make it better. So um, I think we only have about seven minutes left, I believe. I think we're going to have some questions from the audience. I would like to keep the responses from the panelists down to maybe a sentence or two. Let's oh. see if we can get a couple of people. I mean, unless you, know, you want to roll, but I think we're on the clock and we have lots of hands. And let's make them sound bites. You guys can just, we'll, we'll, we won't make it a cat fight. We'll make it a snappy, sound fighty fight. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna go with Phil first, and we have a microphone, so please use that. All right. Thank you. Um, I think a lot of these issues have gotten much, much better over time, and the, the experience, my mother was involved in feminism in the 50s when it was just starting, when she was majoring in biology and chemistry and couldn't get her classes because they were later than the dorm um, curfew. Uh, and was the only woman in most of her classes. And now that has much improved, but I still notice, I work in the pharmaceutical industry, and on the West Coast and on the East Coast where I work, women are often in positions of power. They run departments. They're about equal in the workplace. But I did a year in Ohio a couple of years ago, and it was still very pronounced that the men ran everything and the women were in subservient positions. So we're not all the way there yet, um, but I think that's the kind of equality that we're talking about and the good part of feminism. Um, and my mom got out of the feminism movement in the late 60s when it started to get all tangled up with the hippies and the socialism and got co-opted by a whole different agenda. Right. Um, so my question would be, do we try to move the feminism movement back towards women and away from the socialism thing, or do we look for an alternate movement that is focused on the right things? I, I love your question. Can I speak to sure. this or am yes, I please. talking too much? No, no. Um, oh. I love your question. That's exactly the right question. I'm always saying to my, you know, whatever demographic of feminists who tend to be liberal, because that's the world I came from, um, though I identify as much more libertarian now, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, that there are a million different feminisms. There are going to be conservative feminists, and they're real. There are religious feminists. There are military feminists. There are libertarian feminists. There are anarchist feminists. And what's beautiful to me about that is that, first of all, it creates many, many more good ideas. And again, in a democracy, you need all those ideas. And also, feminism, if you take it by Mary Wollstonecraft's definition, isn't an agenda. Like your word was so right, an agenda, right? It shouldn't be a list of, are you a vegetarian? How do you vote? Do you believe in abortion? It should be a belief that everyone is entitled to equal rights. And then what you do with that is a different set of policies or outcomes, depending on your perspective. And then you fight it out, which is how democracy should work. So I don't think you should drag feminism anywhere. I think this community should develop its own version of what it thinks we should do about gender issues, if you see any of them. And that will enrich everything. And if you want to call it feminism, fine. And if you don't, that's fine. And the whole point is, you know, we're men and women. So let's take women and men seriously, because we're here on the planet together. Well, they're from Mars, and we're from Venus. <laughs> <laughs> that book was not useful. <laughs> Amanda. Uh, Right over here. You know what's fun is when you know everyone's names in the audience. <laughs> I can awesome. just be like, yo, yo. 
Okay, so I reject feminism as an entire ideology. And so I would just want to get from each of you just in like one quick answer. As a female who rejects feminism, what does that make me? An anarchist? <laughs> uh, an individualist? I mean, I, I agree, I hate labels, and I, I, don't, I think you should define yourself and not ask us to define you. You're in charge of yourself. I mean, we could have called this panel. Sorry, Antigone, go. So, <laughs> I'm so bad. Um, well, our, our mutual friend Andre the other day, he's the one who said, um, well, you're a strong, independent woman, hence you must be a feminist, which I did not like. I've been called a self-hating woman. Um, because I don't call myself a feminist. And I just asked Andre, okay, I'm like, I'm of Portuguese descent. So does that mean anything I do is for like Portuguese supremacy? <laughs> right? So everything I do that's kind of cool it becomes a feminist cause? Um, I, I, I don't think it's useful. I think, I, that, I think that if I, you know, if I were to ask you a checklist of your beliefs, like, do you believe women should be paid equally to men? Do you believe women should be free from being raped? Do you believe that women should have representation in government? I'm, I suspect... I would have answered no to all of those. All of them. You, <laughs> you don't think women should be free from being raped? That's what I'm getting at. Is microphone, microphone. Stand up, please. Uh, I think, was your first question about like equal pay and whatnot? Yeah. What I think is that the maximum freedom will be achieved for anyone, women included, when they have the right to negotiate their own contracts. Okay, that's so great. I don't believe that there should be some wage equality imposed oh, upon okay. anyone. I believe I that everyone that. should have the right to and negotiate their own contracts. <laughs> and okay. to speak to the... So that's a, a great answer. I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, and to, to, well, yeah, and I, I agree with her there. And um, also... Thomas Sowell, I think, said this, uh, where he, when he looked at the degrees that people have, et cetera, women actually make 103% right. of what men make right. nowadays. If, if they've never so. been married and if they have if never had kids. Yeah, if it all matches up. Um, the free from being raped thing, it's amazing to me that we haven't talked about rape culture, um, which is you know this new invention of the last two or three years. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, <laughs> but the freedom from being raped, like I'm not free from being murdered, like, right now. Yeah, no, or robbed, or... I'm not, or... like, free from... <laughs> Neither okay, one of us had the porcupine quills. I don't know. I, um, Who knows what's going to happen It's just kind of an odd idea to say, like... Well, I, I really, I'd like to really speak so. to that. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, ooh, free from being raped. What I mean is, you know, only 6% of reported rapes are ever prosecuted, and there's no statistics of how many of that 6% ever go to prison. So my point is, you know, rapists have impunity, but people who murder people don't have impunity in our culture. And um, Sure they do once the, mur once the oh, people start it, murdering the rapists, uh, we'll have a good little cycle. If, well, if you, if you look at the nature of the crime, though, look at the nature of the crime, right? It's a crime that is a legal act that millions of people have every day that is only designated as a crime because oh of two God. states We're, of mind. You're a rape two, apologist? Two you're saying states, rape is okay? No, 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 no. Two states of mind. Two states of mind. Her lack of consent, his awareness of her lack of consent. That is all, all the evidence of rape is evidence of a legal act. All right, right? we're going to another question. Like other than, other than her here. testimony <laughs> and his testimony. Other than that, it's a very, very difficult thing to prove. It's a very difficult thing How to disprove. How are we on time, guys? I think we're close Killing to Killing somebody's always 35. illegal. Okay, we're five minutes over already. So who here thinks they have the most awesome question to wrap all of this up? I, uh, I, My question is very simple, actually, because it, it speaks to the whole issue of uh, feminism as a political agenda. What current legal disabilities currently exist in the law that, that, um, that work against women uh, that need to be addressed from a political point of view? Uh, just very precisely, I mean, what is left for feminism to do? I think there's very little research into um, reproductive issues. 62% uh, of American women are on hormonal birth control. That affects your behavior, that affects your brain. Meanwhile, 
in Europe, there's an IUD with no hormones on really? it. The wow. FDA has not approved it wow. for American use. Want to go to Italy? Let's go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's ridiculous. Wow. That is a sig very significant number of women. Did an avowed anarchist just suggest that the state should uh, regulate IUDs? Because <laughs> The entire reason I can't purchase one is because of the FDA. That's Furthermore, why we have the internet. Oh, right, Silk Road. <laughs> what happened to that? <laughs> Silk Road, we can beat them at their own well, you, game you have to get that thing time. installed. Also, so. also, 25% uh, of American women are on antidepressants. There are also more women on anti-anxiety meds. And, um, and I, I made a post about this like two days ago, that marijuana should be a feminist issue. There are way too many women on drugs mm. in this country. And I'm not talking about the fun ones. <laughs> All okay. right, so I think to wrap it up, just to keep things... Um, on time for the rest of the evening. And of course, Naomi will be our keynote speaker later if she doesn't decide this was <laughs> way too much. I, I'm so looking forward to it. Um, I guess uh, a few last thoughts if... I, I do need to say something as someone with a, a sexual violence in my background. Um, you know, for this community, when I said freedom from rape, I meant I want to live in a society where if God forbid your daughter or one of our daughters is raped, everybody is very concerned about it, doesn't blame her, and tries to put whoever did it away. You know, you don't believe in the state, I believe in prison for that guy. We and carry guns. Bear, bear with me. Well, good. <laughs> That's good, because then you can defend my daughter. Because uh, guns uh, are safer than rape whistles. But I just want to say one thing about... Yeah, that's good. They're more effective than rape whistles, yeah. Can I say one thing about freedom and PTSD? So 30% of women, 17% of men have experienced sexual abuse or assault. Um, PTSD actually damps down your ability to have a consciousness of freedom. And I think it's a political weapon. I think like all these wars that send back you know, tra traumatized veterans with PTSD is a way to keep the population quiescent and oh, obedient. Yeah. So just in the interests of your liberty brain and my liberty brain, you know, le I, I think not, I think rape is a freedom issue and fighting rape and sexual assault and sexual abuse of children is a way to advance liberty. That's what I want to say. All right. I think we'll call it a night. Yeah?